So welcome back to WHC's Conservation Conference. For those of you who don't know me, I am Margaret O'Gorman, the president of WHC. I hope you're all able to attend our Species and Education Project Awards. So congratulations to all the winners and thank you so much for the wonderful videos. During the next two days, don't forget to browse around the event app, visit the WHC Consulting and Certification Hubs, the sponsor area and the community section and interact with other attendees at the conference. But for now, my role is to introduce, present today's keynote speaker, Dr. Scott Edwards. Throughout the presentation, please be sure to ask questions in the comments box on the right, as we're going to have a question and answer section at the end of Dr. Edwards' presentation. But I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Scott Edwards. He's a professor of zoology and curator of ornithology in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. He's a scientist with broad interests in the evolution of life on Earth and the processes that have generated biodiversity. He mostly used birds as models to study patterns of speciation, biogeography, evolution of the genome, and the process of adaptation. This work has exposed his lab to a wide range of questions, from the evolution of immune genes and disease resistance to how best to construct the tree of life. So now, please join me in welcoming Scott Edwards. Thank you and welcome, Scott. Thank you very much, Margaret. Hopefully everyone can see me and hear me. Uh, it's a delight to uh, be a keynote speaker and I really thank you for the generous invitation. And I thank you, uh, Melissa and Sienna and everyone on staff at uh, WHC for uh, organizing this event. Um, I'm very uh, excited to share with you some of my experiences as a scientist studying biodiversity in the United States. And in particular, uh, being an evolutionary biologist is uh, an interesting experience. Um, you're probably aware that the United States ranks fairly low uh, among countries uh, in terms of the proportion of population that believes in evolution. And so, uh, but at the same time, ev evolution is, is very important for our uh, human welfare uh, as a society and as a nation. Um, and uh, it's, all, it's also a great way to expose young students to the wonders of biology. And so today I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, how I uh, see the world through the lens of a, a scientist, how discovering biodiversity and also teaching about biodiversity, particularly through uh, museums. And I'll also tell you a little bit about my uh, experience this summer uh, cycling across the United States. You can see the little inset photo there. <clears throat> uh, and some of my impressions uh, viewing our country uh, from the lens of an ornithologist and a scientist. Now, I was born in Hawaii, although I uh, grew up uh, in uh, Riverdale, New York, which was one of the few um, one of the few parts of the city that has lots and lots of trees. You can see here uh, Wave Hill, where I worked uh, as a high school intern, with the uh, Hudson River in the background and the Palisades of New Jersey. And you know, it's gotten me thinking a lot about how it is uh, someone like me. Uh, you know, becomes a, a scientist since there aren't many African Americans uh, in my field. And I think early exposure to uh, nature and uh, natural history is, is really important uh, for that process. A lot of chance and luck as well. Today, I am fortunate to lead a large laboratory uh, that studies uh, evolutionary biology. And uh, <clears throat> my graduate students and postdocs come from all over the world. Uh, and we try to foster a atmosphere of diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's not easy. Um, many fields of science are closed more, the, more so than they should be to underserved populations and folks who can really add to our field. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a, so it's an ongoing uh, effort, I would say. Now, the MCZ, where I'm sitting right now, 
uh, is a classic uh, uh, 19th century museum. It is uh, one of the most prestigious museums in the country and, and one of the largest, uh, despite its being uh, nestled, nestled within a university context. And the uh, ornithology collection uh, of which I'm the curator used to be on the fifth floor of this uh, brick building that you see uh, in the background there. Uh, and only a few years ago, it was moved to the basement of an adjacent building, which you can see uh, on the inset. Um, fortunately, the collection remained on campus, uh, which is not uh, the fate of many university collections. Um, but what I hope to show you is how uh, exciting uh, museums can be uh, as a, a place to do research and to teach the next generation about biodiversity. So we often think of museums as uh, sort of stale, uh, stagnant, uh, dusty corners where taxonomists uh, uh, proceed in isolation from the rest of the world. Well, couldn't be more different. Um, the MCZ is a vibrant community uh, with extraordinary collections that help us see back in time and to understand how our biodiversity came to be. Uh, and uh, my particular collection uh, it, uh, harbors many extinct species, such as the Carolina parakeets that you see on the lower left. Uh, and we also harbor a growing uh, collection of uh, uh, genetic resources. These are uh, tissues and blood samples of diverse species that uh, fuel a lot of biodiversity research today and, and research relevant to conservation. I, view, I like to view collections as uh, storehouses of environmental history. They're not just about the birds in my case. They're about all of the chemicals, all of the pollen, all of the mites and parasites that these birds carry along that give us insight into uh, our, uh, the history of, of our uh, uh, environments and communities. For example, here's a study that was actually initiated by an undergraduate uh, at Harvard in which she wanted to know whether seabirds such as this black-footed albatross were being impacted by uh, heavy metals being uh, spewed out by factories all over the world. You might think that species such as this albatross, which lives in remote Hawaiian islands and in Japan, might be immune to these environmental assaults. But we were able to show using uh, museum uh, collections going back to the 1880s that in fact the level of or of or of or of or of or okay good thanks um all right everyone can hear me sorry about that <laughs> anyway museums you can look into the past and study past environments now um museums do have a a, a troubling history of uh, racism and colonialism and in fact our museum in the MCZ here was founded by Louis Agassiz, a well-respected scientist from Switzerland, but who you know, actively promoted racist theories of uh, human diversity. Uh, and so you can imagine he would be appalled to learn that, that I, an African-American, would be in charge of a major collection of his museum. You can see me here standing in front of the very chalkboards that uh, uh, Professor Agassiz was lecturing in front of. Uh, we exposed these when we moved the collections a few years ago. So, uh, you know, that's a legacy that we're trying to overcome uh, these days uh, and we're trying to actively combat. Uh, the Tree of Light, Charles Darwin is another 19th century science scientist whose, whose worldview, in fact, is fueling a lot of uh, the museum practice today. And so he uh, arguably had a much more um, egalitarian view of, of diversity. And his vision of common descent is certainly important uh, and driving force in evolutionary biology today. For example, this tree for birds, which was published a few years ago, one of the largest uh, data sets for bird biodiversity uh, published uh, is largely uh, fulfilling Darwin's dream of understanding the genealogy of life. You can see many different lineages of birds here, and we're understanding a lot more about their ecology and evolution uh, as a result of these phylogenetic approaches, which museums are, uh, are promoting. 
We can also look at the evolution of disease and pathogen spread, of course, something very relevant today. For example, our studies in house finches, you can see the picture on the upper right, a small bird, not endangered, but one that has been exposed to a, a really uh, important epizootic, uh, is um, th these studies are made possible by our ability to look back through time using museum collections. You can see that in the 1980s, we had a snapshot of the species uh, before the epizootic hit in the mid 1990s. And then through time, we can track this bird um, and the pathogen because we have access to historical samples. Now, most importantly, museums are really important context for getting kids excited about biodiversity. And we're very fortunate here to be able to take students into the field after they've learned about biodiversity using collections, they can explore that biodiversity in diverse settings around the globe. And uh, this not only exposes students to biodiversity, but also to working with people from other cultures. Uh, I've taken many of my own classes to uh, Costa Rica and to Panama and Mexico, um, and uh, it often is a, a life transforming experience. I should add that we're very fortunate the museum is able to fund these expeditions in their entirety. And so the students don't have to pay for the travel themselves. They also undertake a lot of uh, digital expert exercises. And you know, here's a student um, recording a bird. Uh, I'll see if I can play a, a, a clip from her recording. You can see here, this is a recording of a, uh, an owl uh, that we found in Costa Rica. And students get a real sense of how it is that scientists uh, record biodiversity. And so I want to leave you with a vision for museums that is global and connected and serving the public in many important ways. Here you can see some examples where we're providing information to wildlife managers, to uh, the government, um, to conservation societies, and most importantly, we're educating the next generation to be literate in biodiversity. And so hopefully you have a sense that museums are more than just dusty repositories. They are active participants in um, helping us navigate these very challenging uh, times. And if you're interested in sort of an up-to-date argument for the value of biological collections, I can refer you to this National Academies report that came out last year, actually as I was uh, embarking on my bicycle trip, and which really is a nice overview. You can download a free uh, copy uh, online if you just, uh, or I can put the link in at the end of the talk. And scientists, of course, today, could engage in a lot more activities than just research and teaching. Many scientists, including myself, are actively trying to increase diversity in our fields because we know that in order to do the best science, we need to have diverse perspectives. This means ethnic diversity, geographic diversity, economic diversity. I personally think we need to reach out more to rural students uh, in rural America. Uh, and so um, lots and lots of work to do to make this, to address this challenge. Now I'll segue now to talk about my uh, bicycle trip. And this was something that gradually I've been thinking about for many years, but which I took seriously once the pandemic hit, because I knew that all of our uh, activities as academics or conferences and certainly field work would be canceled for the summer. And so I fulfilled a lifelong dream. Uh, I had been thinking about it for many years, although in, in, in truth, I had about six weeks to put it all together once I realized that the pandemic was here for the rest of the semester and then the summer. Uh, and so it was a really interesting odyssey through our country, viewing our biodiversity in terms of our birds, but also viewing uh, the different communities that I cycled through, many of which were rural uh, and fairly isolated. 
Now, here's my route. I started on June 6th in Plum Island, New Hampshire, and ended up in Sunset Beach, Oregon, about 76 days later and 3,800 miles later. You can see I took a, a northern route, uh, and um, actually many of my um, routes were assisted by maps published by the Adventure Cycling Association, which I happened, I was able to visit the headquarters in Missoula, Montana, and uh, they helped me in numerous ways across uh, this journey. Now, um, when you're setting off on a trip like this, uh, you know, you wanna bring a sleeping bag and a tent and a sleeping pad. You wanna bring a lot of changes of clothes and uh, you wanna bring some tools and spare inner tubes as well as a spare tire in case you run into trouble. Uh, and of course, lots of, of food uh, and a, a digital electronics. Um, uh, and so it's, it's uh, lots, lots to put together, but at the, at the end you're living quite simply. Now the myth of this trip, uh, which caught the press a little bit last summer was that I was sort of writing for racial justice. As the trip evolved, this, I suppose, became more true. But uh, the truth is better captured by this next slide in which I'm really fulfilling a lifelong dream. And, um, you know, I decided to go east to west. I, I originally wanted to go west to east. Supposedly the tailwinds were better that way. But in truth, going east to west had lots of advantages, especially in terms of the unfolding drama of uh, our history as a country. Um, you know, going from east to west, one goes from populated eastern states to much less populated western states. And all of the grandeur of the, uh, the Rocky Mountains and the great rivers of the west. Now, um, let's see here. You can see um, I live fairly simply camping out uh, about half the time. When there was a hotel around, I wasn't uh, proud. I would, I would take it up. But um, as camping as much as I could, and you can see in some of these photos, like in the upper uh, row there, just how empty some of the campgrounds were, especially during the weeks. Um, but it's, it was a really nice way to, um, a lot of the campgrounds at the beginning were uh, closed, in fact, to cyclists because they didn't want you using the the public restrooms. Um, basically, they were only letting RVs in. So that, that caused some challenges uh, along the way, especially at the beginning. Here's an elevational profile showing how I started in the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, cycled through the lowlands of the Erie Canal region, uh, then the uplands of New York, heading my way towards Ithaca, New York, uh, and then uh, to um, the, Erie, the uh, Lake Erie uh, shoreline in Pennsylvania. And then a long stretch in the Midwest where I uh, saw a few patches of what looked like native prairie, although most of it was dominated by uh, agriculture. Uh, and then hitting the uh, uh, Badlands National Park, as well as the Black Hills in South Dakota. There were three main passes in Montana, each about 6,000 feet. And with that, I was able to cross the Rockies remarkably. Uh, I will say, however, that the hardest stretch was in southeastern Washington, which was not only extremely hot, but uh, the grades were incredibly steep in the Palouse region, even though um, in terms of absolute elevation, they were quite a bit lower than the Rockies. Now, uh, I was able to... Um, see a lot of birds during my journey. It, it wasn't really a goal, but of course I did bring with me a, a small pair of binoculars. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I had a lot of experiences. Here you can see some ospreys, an osprey flying around uh, uh, near its nest uh, in Montana. And I also saw um, uh, killdeer, which you can see on the right side. Uh, 
there's a small, you can see it, it's, it's a little small, but you can see a little bird uh, flying on the road there. Um, birds were a constant uh, source of encouragement during the trip and, um, you know, really sort of the one constant during the trip that really kept me grounded. Um, here's a species called the uh, upland sandpiper, which I didn't know at all from my time in Massachusetts, but which I got to know very well uh, cycling through the Midwestern states. It's a uh, shorebird, uh, and despite its name its being a shorebird, it, it nonetheless lives in some of the vast agricultural regions of the Midwest, and it's managed to eke out a living um, in what would seem to us a monoculture. Of course, a lot of my birding was done by ear, and you can see here I'm cycling in South Dakota, you might hear that uh, chipping sparrow in the background. Um, there really wasn't enough time to do a lot of bird watching uh, itself. I would basically get up in the morning, eat breakfast, and then hit the road again. Uh, on the right here, you can see a uh, western, some western kingbirds, which are uh, really one of the first species I encountered in the west, and which made me realize I was really making some headway. Once I hit the uh, Rockies, these are the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming, um, you know, the scenery dramatically changed and also the wildlife. There was lots of uh, pronghorn, uh, lots of sandhill cranes, um, white tailed deer you'll see in just a second. Now these Bighorn Mountains, I decided not to cycle over. I ended up going north up through Montana uh, rather than going over the 9,000 foot uh, powder pass, which I had heard so much about from other cyclists. Um, but it was um, just really awe-inspiring, and you felt very small uh, cycling in this uh, among these huge mountains. The bridges of our country are, uh, as you probably know, great uh, places for swallows to uh, build their nests. And crossing some of the rivers uh, across the country, I would always encounter swallows uh, in sometimes in huge numbers, such as you see here. One of the habitats which was really new to me was the potholes habitat of South Dakota. Now, potholes are uh, little uh, marshlands which thankfully have been preserved in amongst the corn fields and soy soybean fields. You can see here some white faced ibises uh, and also a black tern uh, right here. These are little islands of biodiversity in amongst um, areas that are otherwise fairly depauperate in, uh, in the agricultural regions. And it also reinforced, my trip reinforced the value of our national parks. Here you see, really, when I cycled into the Badlands National Park, I suddenly saw for the first time a variety of species such as bison, uh, pronghorn, uh, prairie dogs, you can hear one yipping in the background there, uh, as well as um, burrowing owls. Uh, and so it was almost like going from silence into this cacophony of wildlife once I crossed into Badlands National Park. So um, just a really stark difference. These The wildlife is really using these uh, parks as uh, refuges. And here, you know, it was interesting to me as a scientist to map some of the species I saw uh, as uh, my route unfolded. So my route there is the little blue line and some of the species which I hadn't seen for a long time or had really no experience with things like the dick sissel, a small songbird in the Midwest, as well as the California scrub jay in the, in the, uh, in the, in the West. Sometimes species stayed with me for many weeks. Other times I only encountered them for a few days. Now, sadly, um, many of the birds I encountered were dead on the road. And um, I think this you know, is a sobering reminder that our highways are real death traps for uh, many, many species of diverse types. And um, you know, as we design new roads, we need to think about how we can be uh, less impactful on our native wildlife. You can see you know, majestic species here like uh, great horned owls and northern flickers and shrikes, just 
very, very sobering reminder of uh, the challenges of wildlife and uh, travel by car. The rivers uh, that I crossed were just one of the great themes, I would say, of the trip. Here you can see a number of rivers in the eastern U.S. that I crossed. Uh, and here you see several from the western U.S. Of course, a lot of history, some of it uh, very inspiring, others somewhat tragic. Of course, like the Little Bighorn River, the site of uh, a major, uh, one of the few uh, battles that uh, you know Native Americans won during uh, our uh, the spread of uh, uh, Westerners across the country in the 19th century. And um, but. Most importantly, I think the rivers were just this constant source of, of awe and beauty. Uh, and here was a spot along the Yellowstone River in uh, Montana, where I, I cycled along this river for uh, at least a week. Uh, you may know that the Yellowstone is the, uh, has the longest undammed stretch of river in the lower 48. It's over 600 miles. And um, just a really interesting uh, link with the natural environment as well as with history. You're probably aware that Lewis and Clark spent many weeks uh, along the Yellowstone River. I was fortunate enough to intersect uh, with uh, Native American lands uh, and Native Americans uh, in different contexts. For example, I learned that uh, the Meskwaki tribe, only federally recognized Native American uh, nation in Iowa. And so uh, little things like this allowed, you know, moving slowly through the landscape allowed me to uh, appreciate again uh, the extraordinary legacy and contributions of Native Americans uh, to our country. Lots of celebration of Native Americans and their art. And here you can see um, some really uh, inspiring works of art celebrating uh, different aspects of Native American life. Many of the small the small towns I traveled through were thriving. They were inspirational. Here you see a, a 1800s era schoolhouse that was lovingly restored by the couple in the lower uh, center there. Um, but other towns were clearly on hard times. And you know there were lots of examples of the, the shifts in economics, which are causing some towns to thrive and others to uh, having to find their way in the 21st century. Again, the world of agriculture was an ever-present theme. Uh, and you can see here uh, just the um, the different um, time scales. Some some of it was forward looking. We see lots of wind energy, for example, going through the Midwest. Whereas uh, other aspects, you know, such as this coal train, uh, you know, I, I, I the bottom line is, for better or worse, it's it's uh, it's on the decline. And um, but it was interesting and 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 challenging, I would say, to witness some of the human lives behind uh, some of these changes in economics. For example, uh, you know, I talked with a woman in Gillette, Wyoming, who was lamenting the demise of coal because, you know, her family had been raised in that environment. And, and I think as we transition, we need to make sure we're not just leaving behind um, others. We need to figure out how to uh, bring everyone into the new economy. And just again, the, the, the scale of agricultural infrastructure in the country was just staggering. Um, but I also uh, answered a, a, a key question that I had had, uh, which was uh, how these, um, oops, sorry, how these uh, circular bales of hay get, um, get uh, created. This is, you see them on the landscape, but I never knew how they were made. And I actually got to learn about that in, um, South Dakota. And so, you know, a lot of learning, I would say, both ways. You know, I'm, I'm a PhD, but I learned a lot from rural folks, farmers, uh, and I tried to do my best to see their perspective on, on life. As I mentioned, Lewis and Clark was a big theme, especially after crossing the Missouri River. 
and um, you know it. It well, I, I would I would highly recommend uh, this Missouri Headwaters State Park in Montana, which you see on the upper right. Uh, it's for all, as far as I'm concerned, it should be a, a national park. This is of course where Lewis and Clark discovered the headwaters, the so-called headwaters of the Missouri River. In their case, the headwaters were formed not from some trickle uh, on a mountaintop, but from the conjunction of uh, three great rivers, the Gallatin, the Madison, and the Jefferson. And uh, in many ways, this was the goal of their journey, uh, despite the fact that they ended up uh, traveling for another year and a half um, uh, to come back to uh, St. Louis. Uh, and of course, Sacagawea is uh, indicated on the bottom row. Um, some really, really, uh, and, and you know, I think the, the credit that she is due is, is increasing uh, with every history that you read. Now, as Margaret mentioned, I, I began my journey almost at the same time as our country was descending into some real challenging times uh, and uh, you know really uh, outrageous um, uh, injustices uh, to people of color. Uh, we had uh, George Floyd, of course, and many others who've been victims of police brutality. And uh, an incident which was well known to bird watchers uh, where a, a black bird watcher, Christian Cooper, was um, you know subject to a very sinister uh, racist incident in Central Park in New York. Now, at the beginning of my trip, I, you know, as I said, I wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream. And yet, within the first week, I was seeing these very uh, moving, uh, earnest expressions of outrage um, in many different forms. Here's some handmade signs in Vermont and New York. And so, you know, I couldn't just sit idly by, I needed to participate somehow. And so I did that by um, affixing a bunch of signs to my bicycle. Now, in many cases, uh, you know, cycling through areas where there weren't many people, it wasn't as if I was converting the masses. But, you know, through social media and also perhaps more importantly, through in-person meetings with folks that I ran across, you know, I got a sense of, um, what what people thought about Black Lives Matter, what some of the perceptions were like. They weren't always positive, but uh, I would find support in, in many unlikely places. I also picked up a couple signs from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in New York, where I'm a, a, a board member. And uh, these signs, Birds Spark Hope, and one song, many voices, you know, I think capture some of the ways in which nature and natural history can be a unifying force in uh, in these very challenging times. Adding a little bit of humor to what was a very challenging summer, here I was tweeting how maybe the cows at least are listening to Black Lives Matter. I didn't mean to make light of the movement, of course, but it was in retrospect, somewhat odd to have these signs on my bike, and yet many days seeing very few people, uh, especially, as, especially as I was moving from town to town. By the time I got to Portland, Oregon, uh, you know, the full uh, expression of the outrage uh, was, was evident. And of course, uh, Portland was the, really in many ways the epicenter of the uh, protests last summer. And, you know, uh, it, I would say one of the main lessons I took from last, um, uh, last summer was the divide in this country, not being so much between black and white, but I think really between urban and rural. Now, of course, urban and rural and black and white, they do vary, uh, they do co-vary a lot together. And yet, you know, you would go from uh, just one political spectrum, for example, riding into Iowa City, just in the fields outside of Iowa City, one political spectrum. Once you enter the city, it was the complete opposite. And so, you know, I think learning and listening 
to others that are different from us, not just ethnically, but e economically. I think that's going to be uh, really important in the years uh, ahead. I will say, I don't want you to give you, get you the impression that the uh, trip was, uh, you know, uh, well, certainly it was challenging. I don't want to give you the impression that I was encountering racism constantly. In fact, quite the opposite. If there's any theme I can say with about the people that I met was that there's a huge amount of generosity in this country. Not everyone on this screen I agreed with politically, and yet to a person, they offered me food, lodging, shelter, safety. Um, and I think it's, a lot of times I found that it's because people don't have experience of other people, other kinds of people, that perhaps there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, the potential of this country and, and, the, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the impetus behind movements like the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of misconceptions about what it stood for and uh, you know maybe it was being funded by the Democrats, which the uh, man on the upper left suggested to me. So, and we tend to just learn all this stuff on whatever news stations we watch. I think connecting with people uh, on the ground is, can hopefully get us around some of these misconceptions. And if I had to, uh, I, I can just end with a couple pieces of advice that I got, which found, I found very useful. Um, the first bit of advice I got was to eat well. <laughs> I think I, I reshuffled my diet and I've, fortunately I've tried to maintain that now bike trip's been over for a year. Um, but perhaps more importantly, you know, it was important for me not to focus on the end point. I wasn't thinking about getting to Oregon every day. I was thinking about uh, getting through just this one day. And, and perhaps more importantly, in the last bullet, to enjoy myself. You know, there's, even if it's one person traveling, you've got only one person to take care of. There's a lot of logistics that you need to figure out each day. And you sometimes forget you know, why you're on this journey. And, um, but, you know, to try to snap out of it and just realize that what we have in this country is extraordinary in terms of the natural resources uh, and the intellectual resources. And, um, and just to appreciate that as you're cycling was a really uh, priceless, priceless experience. And so uh, I think that's it. And uh, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Scott, thank you so much for that. That was a really interesting presentation that wove so many different things together, you know, following the range of birds, following um, emerging so social issues across the country last year during a global pandemic. It's so multidimensional. Now, as you know, I'm also a cycle tourist, but I have been warned not to <laughs> dominate the conversation on that. But I will remark that, you know, your comment about, you know, 99% of people when you meet on the trail, it's trail magic usually that they call hiking, are kind, are generous and will go out of their ways to help you out. Do you have, I, I have stories of, of crazy things that have happened to us on the trail. Do you have any specific story of where somebody kind of went out of their way to help you out when you were on the trail? Well, thanks, Margaret. Yeah, um, it's it's great that you can appreciate uh, a trip like this, being a cyclist yourself. Um, yes, lots of examples. You know, cases where a, a car would pull up beside me, stop, and then you know offer me a, a a bottle of cold water. And now I thought that this, in I thought that you know this person was on their way to do some errand on their own, but it turns out once. Once we chatted and, and uh, drunk the water, that they, they turned around and went back home. They said, "Oh, they they saw me cycling past their house." To think that someone would, you know, come out of their house and get out of their living room to just to give a bottle of water was just amazing. Um, and you know, the one time I tried to sort of wing it in terms of accommodation, just to try find the accommodation uh, along the way, you know, there were no hotels in this area of Illinois where I was, and there was no campgrounds. 
you know, I actually had quite some challenges finding a backyard that I could uh, camp in. I, you know, people kept pointing me down to the next uh, place. They mentioned a, a camp that might be able to take me in. Turns out they, they weren't willing to let me uh, camp there despite acres and acres of, uh, of, uh, of nice grass. Uh, and, you know, I had sadly, a, a, you know, an incident where a woman, I asked if I could camp in her yard and she basically said, no, not with that sign on your bicycle. And that of course was very frustrating, but the same, that same evening, you know, I found, a, I, I was referred to a, a, a couple that lived in rural Illinois and yet had worked with uh, troubled youth in Chicago, uh, black youth. They were very religious and yet they really, they Black Lives Matter, they were comfortable with it, they understood it. And not only did they let me stay with them, they, they gave me a bed, they fed me for the night. And so uh, it was a, you know, a really nice ending to what was, I think, a very challenging day. But um, again, it gave me hope, I think. Yeah, absolutely. No, we've I've had so many experiences, positive experiences with people helping out in times of need when you're on the bicycle. Um, but I have to bring you back a little bit because we got some questions earlier in your presentation, which was about the teaching side of things. And we got a question about your museum, which I think is an interesting one. Um, is that you? How does your museum um, talk about mass extinctions and? especially the current, the sixth extinction that's happening now. How do you address that um, in, the mu in your museum? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, any of the listeners are, are, are justified in, 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 in questioning, you know, do we really need all these specimens uh, to understand biodiversity? And I would say that, you know, the impact on wildlife that uh, you know, museums have is vastly, vastly smaller than, for example, the impact of uh, feral cats in our country, uh, the impact of, of climate change and habitat loss. You know, the small number of specimens that we do take, we, we feel it's it's worth it in terms of our understanding of science and, and our uh, educational uh, capabilities. Um, in terms of mass extinction, yes, you know, I think uh, museums are a great forum to convey to students the reality of extinction. When you hold a passenger pigeon or a Carolina parakeet in your hand, you, it becomes very graphic that this species is not going to come back. You know, uh, genetic engineering notwithstanding, um, it's gone forever. And so um, I think, and, and there's lots of ways you can convey to students how populations change through time. We might view the world as very static, but in truth, birds and all kinds of organisms are actually changing through time. And we can actually measure that with museum specimens. And I think that can be very compelling for students. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, I love what you say about holding in your hand a species that no longer exists um, and, and, and certain species that no longer exist in the wild, seeing them in zoos can be a very transformative experience. But you, you led me to another question. You started your photograph, you started with the photograph of um, looking out across to the New Jersey Palisades. The New Jersey Palisades, you know, were a great habitat for peregrine falcons until they became extinct east of the Mississippi. And the first pair of peregrine falcons that nested were on actually a Hilton Hotel in Atlantic City in New Jersey. So, so people talk about how peregrines are very adaptive species but what is the difference between adaptation, which is basically a species figuring out how to use a new habitat and evolution? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, adaptation, uh, evolutionary biologists define it as, you know, uh, genetic change that allows uh, a species to uh, fit into its environment better or to exploit its environment better. Um, however, there's a lot of of change out there, which is not really genetic in nature. Um, you know, for example, peregrine falcons re-nesting in uh, New Jersey, that's more a case of, well, the population has come up to some critical mass where now falcons are actually looking 
to cities to uh, to nest. And so, um, and and the and the fact is, you know, their natural habitat includes cliffs, and uh, really, they're looking for certain structures in the environment rather than perhaps uh, that, rather than a particular environment. And so, um, you know, we we evolutionary biologists call this, you know, uh, plasticity or just the ability to uh, behaviorally uh, take advantage of of one's environment. And so, um, and that's you know, there's still unclear how whether uh, uh, animal responses to climate change will primarily consist of adaptation or plasticity. That's a big question right now. Um, there's some, for some species, it's pretty clear that genetic adaptation will be possible given how fast the environments are changing. Um, but for others, uh, plasticity will allow them to exploit uh, new environments as they arise. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. So we have um, Jim Warren from the Carolina Raptor Center. And Jim wants to know, what species of owl was the student listening to in Costa Rica? Oh, oh, right. Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a pygmy owl. Uh, I, I, I actually, I'm not sure the exact species, but um, you know, pygmy owls have this very high pitched whistle, sort of a repeated whistle. And um, you know, it was one of these great examples. When you're leading a, a, a trip with students, you're 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 nervous. You, you want to you hope that the wildlife will perform for them, right? Because you're bringing them to this place, and this owl basically sat in this tree for about ten minutes, just hooting. We could all see it. Multiple students got to record it, and um, yeah, it's um, and 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 some of all a lot of these recordings, you know, we 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 sent to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to put in their audio archives, so the students have a sense of. Uh, contributing to the database of of, uh, of knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. And Jim actually also asked a question that I had, which is the sign that you were holding that was hashtag shut down STEM. We are big proponents of STEM here. Why do we need to shut down STEM? Yeah, it was kind of a weird name. You know, it's 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 it was kind of like you know the other another hashtag of last summer. You know, defund the police. It, it didn't quite convey what I think people wanted it to. You know, Shutdown STEM was a, a one day, uh, basically day of reflection among scientists in which instead of going to uh, the lab and, and doing your work as usual to, you know, reflect or have conversations about why is it that our STEM workforce is not as diverse as uh, our population? Uh, and so on that day, which was, I think it may have been June 20th or something last year. I, I'm, and I don't know if it's going to happen again this year. Keep your eyes open. But, um, you know, it was, a, it was a time to reflect on uh, what we can do to make science more welcoming and, uh, you know, to convince ourselves if we need convincing that we need more diverse viewpoints in science. There are lots of examples where uh, some of the best ones that I'm aware of, for, for example, when women were uh, gained more access to an the study of animal behavior, suddenly we learned a lot more about the role of females in, in mating systems. And that's a fairly academic uh, example, but there are lots of cases where, you know, not only how we study things, but what we study, what are the problems that people find important? These are, this is when we need diverse viewpoints. And so shutdown STEM was to, um, to try to begin to hear those viewpoints that uh, have, have been suppressed. Okay. Yes, a very good point. I mean, the, one of the classics is how heart disease is being studied in men, but when women present with um, the symptoms of heart disease in women, it's not recognized because the way the studies have been done. So having a, a variety of viewpoints is so important. Um, yeah. Across the yeah. And of course, you know, in, in human biomedical studies, you know, the vast majority of them are done on European pop derived populations and yeah, yeah uh, doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you've got being given some kudos by uh, Casey Martin, I think who's from out from Colorado that says, um, well done for going to small towns, small town America and listening and learning there. And I think, you know, Casey, the, the point is, it's such a good one because even on a road trip, you don't get to small town America because the way our infrastructure is built. And I think that's one of the beauties of a bike trip is that you see places 
that you do, wouldn't normally get to. There's no airports there. There are really not a lot of highways if you're going on a road trip. So being able to immerse yourself in small town America, um, especially in the middle, um, must have been just a really, really um, nice experience across across the board for you. And, and so you've gotten some kudos from Casey Martin from Colorado on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's really there are thousands of small towns out there that and it was just great to be able to just see glimpse them a little bit. Um, I can recommend one in particular, Arvada, Wyoming. Uh, I had a few pictures of it there. It's 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 out of the way. Trust me. Um, but um, the people there are really nice uh, and they'll let you camp behind their store if you ask them. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I must remember that if I ever get to do my cross country trip that I've always wanted to. <laughs> and I just have another question. I think we're getting to the end of this. I mean, this has been a great conversation for me and of course I could keep going, but the bird fatalities on highways, um, you know, that was quite a striking graphic and we know that bird fatalities on buildings are, are, are strong. And also um, Jim from Carolina talked about that bird strikes are the biggest, um, cause of injury at the Raptor Center. So what should, what precautions should drivers or landowners along major roads or even road designers do to, to kind of address this issue? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. My one suggestion is simply to drive more slowly. I would say that both for uh, preserving human life as well as uh, avian life. Um, you know, we've 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 made some progress in terms of uh, infrastructure in buildings that can minimize, uh, you know, window strikes. For example, there are types of glass that can be used that birds can see more easily, uh, and some uh, major structures such as stadiums and whatnot are are being built with these new materials. In terms of highways, that's a really tough one, and you know, there are probably some great ideas out there. I mean, I might as well make the pitch now as well for just more human-centered approach to our highways. I mean, and you probably know this, Margaret, from cycling in Europe, uh, you know, uh, we are not a bike-friendly country and uh, we need to uh, expand access to the whole diversity of our roadways to cyclists. I think in Europe, both in the cities and in the countryside, it's much, much safer to uh, to bicycle. Um, we shouldn't have to worry about uh, you know cars when we're cycling and enjoying nature. Basically, cyclists are hitchhiking, they're parasitizing off of our highway infrastructure, which is not a sustainable solution. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, I 100% agree with that. As somebody who both commutes and cycle tours, um, I would love to see infrastructure that's more bicycle friendly. But um, Scott, thank you so much. Um, that was very inspiring. Um, I was inspired to go across the country until I saw your gradient maps. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks a lot. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for that really interesting conversation. And we're really pleased to have had you here today. So for everybody else, I'm glad you all um, attended and thank you for the great questions. So coming up at our, um, on our next conference panel is a sponsored session from Wildlife Acoustics. So maybe take some of the um, information that Scott had for us about bird sound and we might learn something more. And then this afternoon, we have two more interesting sessions, uh, Crab versus Corona, which I mentioned in my opening speech about how the horseshoe crab is critical to addressing um, and coming back from COVID and also a discussion on environmental education and training. So we're ending the day with the networking happy, happy hour rooms that I mentioned. And also please spend some time to browse the event platform where you can visit the sponsor pages. So thank you all so much for joining us. And um, thank you also to Scott. And we will see you all later. So have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye.